You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It's Thursday, May 24th, 2018. My name is Michael Brooks on a Michael and Sam Hybrid Thursday. On today's program, David Graber on BS Jobs. Sam did this interview just a couple of days ago. Great look at how our economy generates useless activity, which is soul-crushing and unnecessary with David Graeber. Then, got a lot to get to, including Donald Trump canceling his summit with Kim Jong-un, realizing he was being played by getting played by other people. There's no fun flag when you win the Nobel, or no fun map when you win the Nobel Prize. No runners up. North Korea says it's up to the U.S. whether they meet at the table or in a nuclear showdown. So that brief couple of weeks of nice news is fading. The NFL owners have approved a new national uh, anthem policy, uh, which literally suppresses free speech um, and the exercise of individuals in America to express their sentiments on one of the most vital issues in America in our present and history. 53% of Americans say it's, quote, never appropriate to kneel during the anthem. I would be on the other side of that poll question, but I'm on the other side of this one as well. Jared Kushner has gotten his security clearance back. What a surprise. And Trump, Trump's lawyer, was paid by Ukraine to arrange White House talks. Michael Cohen, very active in his LLC business. And the special counsel is setting in motion the sentencing process for George Papadopoulos from Model UN to State Pen. All that and much, much more on today's Majority Report. Let's start with this. Um, We know, uh, by the way, we're all here except, of course, for Sam. Sam, who's like, Michael's never here, but I do a four-day work week, and it's bar mitzvah, so I need two days off. Do you see? Makes total sense. Um, We uh, talked about uh, yesterday how the NFL uh, have introduced uh, new restrictions, basically, on players' right to free speech uh, and democratic expression. This has been an area of attack which really does matter. It actually has national implications. It's not a college protest. And it's also been an attack on a group of people's rights to freely exercise their political concerns and speech that was spearheaded by the President of the United States. Here is a segment with uh, Fox and Friends, uh, the brain trust of the White House, and uh, Brian Kilmeade actually was able to share the news Uh, with Trump himself, who was in Long Island yesterday, uh, fear-mongering and lying about something else. And here's his breaking news answer. Some breaking news while you were in there. The NFL has made a decision on something that means a lot to you and a lot of other Americans. The NFL has vo- the owners have voted unanimously to approve a new national anthem rule that says if you're not going to stand, stay in the locker room. If you go to the field, you have to stand. If you have a protest, your team's going to get fined. This is the first time you're hearing this. What's your reaction, Mr. President? Well, I think that's good. I don't think people should be staying in locker rooms, but still, I think it's good. You have to stand proudly for the national anthem. Well, you shouldn't be playing. You shouldn't be there. Maybe you shouldn't be in the country. You have to stand proudly for the national anthem. And the NFL owners did the right thing if that's what they've done. If if that is the story, do you feel like you pushed this story forward and you pushed this to a conclusion? I think the people pushed it forward. This was not me. I brought it out. I think the people pushed it forward. This country is very smart. We have very smart people. And You know, that's something ideally could have been taken care of when it first started. It would have been a lot easier. But if they did that, they're doing the right thing. 
I, mean, yep. I, I think it's a 7 out of 10. I, you, what he just brought up is true. You're going to say, okay, I'm, they're missing four players from the 49ers, mm-hmm. from the Giants, from the Jets. Why are they in locker room? What are you mad about the country right. for? And then what if you sit there and you put your fist in the air? Well, every, if, you know, you know, yeah, Ryan, you're well, there's all these different ways that you can't monitor the behavior of these black guys on the field. I, I mean, what if they uh, put their fist up as an example? What are they? Uh, they're they're not upset about America per se. They're upset about state murders of uh, people uh, of uh, different racial backgrounds. That's what they're upset about. And actually, more broadly, if you listen to some of them, like uh, Colin Kaepernick, who's of course very articulate on this issue, they're actually upset about a much wider criminal justice system um, that obviously uh, disproportionately targets black and Latino people, but actually uh, across the board in the United States uh, kills a lot of people. (laughs) Uh, That's what they're upset about. Um, Not whatever uh, fantasy is going on in Brian Kilmeade's head. Uh, You know, I mean, look, we already know that this is a racist, thug, stupidity-driven administration. But I will note this. When he called MS-13 guys animals, and people made the point that introducing that rhetoric, even if only supposedly you're specifically talking about gang, when in reality people know that on a daily basis ICE is terrorizing countless innocent people, both undocumented and documented people, on a racial basis, on an ethnic basis, We know that bringing in that kind of language is an extension of that process. The end point there of he's still bitching and moaning about even the locker room rule, which is already an incredible violation of these players' rights. And by the way, once again, private platforms. See, this is where the right is ridiculous. You don't have a right to free speech on a private platform because that's how we've designed our economy. Twitter can kick you off. The NFL can create whatever ridiculous, oppressive speech-denying rule they want. So the answer is is containing and creating public platforms versus private platforms to, in fact, ensure free speech because this is a private sector racialized attack on free speech. But when he's introducing... Maybe they just shouldn't be here. Look out for that kind of language. Look out for, as we head up into 2018 and certainly 2020, talk about stripping birthright citizenship. And in his own stupid way, that rhetoric is on a continuum of a much broader racialized assault. I think we have this video now. I know is this also on the list? Uh, it's not on the list. Okay, set it. I know what video this is, but set it up. Yeah, this is Sterling Brown, a guard for the Milwaukee Bucks. And I don't think it was lost on professional athletes that the same day the owners announced this policy, this footage from this incident in January where he is it was like a traffic uh, potential part a potential parking violation. He ended right. up getting like taken down by a bunch of cops and stunned. We'll play a He was bit tased and then the cops laughed at him. So that's what they're protesting. That's what they're objecting to. And anybody who supports democracy and isn't a disgusting person should be aligned with them in that. And of course, we have a president and a Fox News and all too many NFL fans and of course, all too many NFL owners. I believe the Jets owners have raised some objections to this um, who aren't committed to democracy and are disgusting people also let's be pedantic for a second it doesn't start till september doozy moron okay we're going to take a brief break this is sam's interview with david graber on bs jobs really really interesting uh, work here 
And then we will be back in about 50 minutes and we will take you to the fun half. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report, on the phone. It is a, a pleasure uh, to welcome back to the program David Graber, author of his most recent Bullshit Jobs. Of course, uh, you were last on this program uh, several years ago uh, to talk about your book, Debt. Um, David, welcome back to the program. Well, thanks for having me. So, uh, Bullshit Jobs, this came out of a, a piece you wrote uh, a couple years ago, let um tell us what constitutes a bullshit job. Ah, well, a bullshit job is a job where even the person doing the job secretly believes that either it would make no difference at all if the job didn't exist, or possibly the world might be a slightly better place. So it's a it's it's a job that doesn't need to exist, and critically that the person in the job actually knows that, but has to pretend otherwise, obviously, for reasons of employment. Um, I, I want to go into like what specific jobs. I mean, I, you know, um, having come from the entertainment industry, I mm -hmm. always um, uh, felt that, I mean, I had a manager, a business manager, an agent, and an attorney, Oh. Um, uh, all of whom were taking, you know, a cut and it, it was one of the, the dynamic was, I mean, if everybody unilaterally fired, let's say their manager, it would mm -hmm. be, it would make no difference whatsoever. Is that, w would that be a bullshit job or is it like, um, you know, and the managers, I don't think that they thought that they were, or the agents thought that they had a bullshit job, but it seemed to me they were just, uh, unnecessarily putting themselves um, interjecting themselves in the middle of something. Well, yeah. I mean, agents basically only exist because, it's my understanding at least, that agents exist because so often people just refuse to pay you. So, you know, agents originally were created so authors don't have to spend their entire time, you know, writing missives to their publishers saying, why haven't you given me my money and, and harassing them and so forth. So they get someone to do that for them. But um, a lot of the other levels, actually, I have a categorization of different types of bullshit jobs. And and this corresponds to the category I call goons. Um Basically, they're people who only exist because other people are employing them. That is to say, corporate lawyers would be a good example. Uh, and it, it kind of goes back to, um, say, feudal lords would be like this. You know, feudal lords are supposed to provide protection for their peasants. But who are they protecting them from? Other feudal lords. Uh, so if there were no feudal lords, you wouldn't need feudal lords. And similarly, corporate lawyers, right? If nobody had a corporate lawyer, you wouldn't need a corporate lawyer. Uh, you could say the same thing of a lot of PR and advertising. You only need advertising because, you're, because your competitor is doing it. Telemarketers almost always feel their jobs are bullshit. So a lot of those guys seem to fit that category. You know, you only need them because other people have them. It's funny. There is a, um, uh, a joke about the lawyer who moved to a, a small town, put up a uh -huh. shingle, and had no business until the day another lawyer moved lawyer in. Lawyer moved in. Yeah, perfect. I didn't know that one. That's perfect. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, but, uh, all right, well, let's go through those archetypes, uh, but let's start with the goons insofar as, like, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, and I certainly know a lot of corporate lawyers, and, and, and um, uh, a lot of them are not, are extremely unhappy uh, yeah. with their, with their career choice, and would... Uh, I, I think if, I've ever talked to one who was happy, but then again, they are the ones who would talk to me. Well, and but and and I and I say this as someone who who went to law school for a year, anyways, and <clears throat> met every single person I have uh, reconnected with through those years. Said you made the right move, uh, <laughs> but but what I mean, what how would I mean? Presumably, right there, is it is it just that uh, the the corporations would figure out a way of, of figuring it out themselves? Is it uh, and if there was a dispute, the the judge would just basically come to a conclusion that wasn't as um, rote or, you know, narrowly tailored as uh, as it might I mean, be today? Or 
Yeah, I mean, you could just work things out. You know, you, you each state your case. There are places where that's still done, and presumably that's the way things were done before the rise of this sort of massive law, legal industry that we have today. You know, you come in, you may state your case. Um, other people state their case. There's a certain tradition of precedent. The judge might decide. Um, there's lots of ways to do things without having all this legal mumbo jumbo and briefs and 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 legal aids and armies of, of of paralegals and so forth and so on. Okay, so we have five archetypes. Uh, the goons are one of them. Uh, tell us about the duct tapers. Ah, uh, yes, that's a term. Kind of comes out of the software industry. At least I adopted it from someone who um, was talking about freeware. And he said, it's very interesting. He said, there's two types of jobs in software, and one is becoming extinct. One of them is the fun part, where you're actually creating new um, types of applications. Now, that's interesting in creative work. So as in so many things nowadays, corporations feel if there's anything people would do for any reason other than the money, they shouldn't have to pay them or they should have to pay them as little as possible. In this case, I don't pay them at all because most of that stuff is now freeware. So, however, there's the second job is duct taping because often you, people create software, but they don't figure out how they're going to work together. They have all these glitches and problems. Um, so duct taping is sort of j- – fixing them up so that they can actually interact with each other and work well together. Now, the more these products are made by people just for the love and fun of doing it, the less they have to worry about making them integrate with one another, so the more you need duct tapers. So what you end up having is a system where increasingly the same guys are working for free to develop software at night, and then they're paid during the day to do the duct taping to make them all fit together because no one would possibly do that for free so i generalized from that and i said well you know like duct taping is a type of job that occurs a lot and and the example i always think of first is there was one time when we needed to call a carpenter the shelves collapsed in my office at goldsmiths uh where i was working and buildings and grounds kind of came in said oh yeah we only need to send the carpenter get those books off the floor and we'll send them next week and then next week comes by never shows up and we start calling every day and the carpenter never comes and finally i realize there's a guy sitting here in an office whose entire job seems to be to apologize for the fact that the carpenter didn't come <laughs> And that's all he does. And, and and he seemed a rather sad and wistful person. He was very good at his job. You, you feel terrible. You don't want to get mad at him. You know, he's a great flat catcher. But I you know, kept thinking to myself, okay, I don't think he's very happy with this job. Like, can't they just fire that guy and hire another carpenter? Then they won't need him. Or just retrain him as a carpenter, maybe. But – that's a perfect example of a duct tape. But wait, did you talk to him? I mean, maybe he's, is he doing like other, th- I mean, presumably you're not the only person he's dealing with, right? Maybe for the other people he's coordinating, the carpenter needs to go there at 3 p.m. or, or something like that. No? or yeah, But it seems unlikely that the carpenter's job was so complicated he couldn't just like keep a little notebook. So he would keep his own schedule in that instance. I mean, because the, the duct tapers you're talking about from the perspective of, of the, um, the software, I mean, they seem to be important, no? The, you want to be able to integrate these pieces of software, or are you suggesting that they should have just been hired to develop and integrate them simultaneously? Exactly. That's what the guy was suggesting. The only reason that these things don't fit together is because they insist on letting pe- making do- people do it for free. Ah, because they don't want to pay you to develop it. They'll just pay you to make it um, uh, yeah, exactly. I- integrate. Yeah. Exactly. So the duct taper is, is, would be exa- anybody who's there because the system is badly designed, and rather than fix it, they simply hired someone to deal with the damage. And you know, it would be the equivalent of like, oh, look, there's a, there's a leak in the roof. Nah, I don't want to reshingle the roof. I'll just put a bucket there and hire someone to empty the water every hour. And and so okay, so that's the the, the duct tapers. Um, the what I mean, what other class? I mean, the goons. You were able to say like, okay, corporate lawyers, um, yeah. and uh, you know, hosts of of people uh, like that who who try and get you to to PR pay. Guys, advertising. 
I mean, I wouldn't have actually made up this category myself, but I asked people to send in examples of their most pointless forms of employment. And a lot of people wrote in who were like telemarketers or PR guys. Or, um, so you got to, you know, and obviously they're serving a function for their employer, corporate lawyers often too. So I had to make, figure out how, why do these people think their jobs are bullshit? And I realize it's like because they feel it's socially unnecessary or even socially harmful. And let I mean, but in terms of duct tapers, what cl- what 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 jobs w- would be out there that we would know? I mean, and, you know, guys who sit taking calls to schedule the carpenter. But what other sort of class of stuff is it like dispatchers at large? Um, it- oh, I mean, I got a lot of people whose jobs were essentially to clean up their boss's mess. Um, you know, they were there so that their boss just didn't have to think about stuff that he really should have had to think about. Um, so. For example, there was one case where this person's job was to take reports written by this expert and try to put them into something resembling English and then convince him to make it more coherent. So their entire job was to say they weren't entire, you know, they couldn't just rewrite it entirely themselves. Um, They had to go to the person and try to convince them to change it around. Um, So their entire job was only there because their boss couldn't write or couldn't be bothered to like make some make a coherent argument. And that happened a lot. That's classic women's work, right? You know, the guy goes around oblivious and you have to hire some woman to do all the real work of cleaning up after them. And, uh, well, let's get, I, I want to get to the implications of these jobs and like why they exist and, 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 you know, uh, how they sort of, I guess, harm us, you know, even uh, societally in, in a moment. So let's go to the flunkies. Ah, yes. And in some in some ways, almost all of these jobs are flunky jobs. These are basically only exist to make someone else look good. And to some degree, you only have these jobs because even when they discover this guy is a useless um, duct taper, for example, you know, I could fix the problem, but I'd rather have more staff because if I'm in a large corporation, my importance is measured by how many people I have working on. Right. So there's no incentive to fire people. I mean, you downsize the blue-collar workers. Like if you work for UPS, you know, sure, you cut down on the number of actually delivery of actual delivery people, and you you speed them up, and you just make their life miserable. But then when it comes to the guy sitting in the office who's just playing fruit mahjong or minesweeper all day, well, you don't have any incentive to fire him. Um, So so there's a huge split between blue-collar and white-collar workers in that regard, and. But but flunkies are essentially just there to make someone else look good. And there's a lot of people, the example I give a lot, and I got a lot of people who write an example to this, was unnecessary receptionists. Now, obviously, some receptionists are just busy all the time. They're very necessary. But even if you don't really need a receptionist, you need to ha- you, you feel you need to have one there. If you if I'm a small publisher and maybe I get one or two calls a day maximum, no problem having the people who actually work in the office just take the calls directly. Nonetheless, you want to have someone sitting at the front desk to, like, say hello to the one visitor per day and the the one or two calls they get. To establish Um, the prestige of what's going on here. Exactly, because if you don't have one, you don't seem like a real company. Um, And that's kind of the definition of a flunky. They're just there because it makes you look good. I've also heard that, um, and I'm, there's one company in particular, I'm not going to say what it, what it is, but someone told me that uh, they were very smart because they hired a ton of people below them so that mm-hmm. uh, when uh, cutbacks come, they're going to be able to jettison a bunch of people. <laughs> And, and, go. and keep so it, intentionally hire necessary people so that they can say, oh, we're lean and mean. We cut half the fat. You know? e- exactly. Like just <laughs> larding up so that you can you can actually dispense with the lard when you need to and look like you're a uh, lean and mean manager. Um, so those are the uh, flunkies. I heard that, yeah. uh, box tickers. Yes. Box tickers are people who are there to make it look like you're doing something that you're not actually doing. And obviously governments are famous for this. You know, if we discover that, oh, my God, there is corruption or you know, police are shooting black people or oh, something, there's something going on that is obviously bad. Uh, the first thing you do is you say, I will have a commission of inquiry. Um, and that's there to make it seem like. Well, if we find out that, first of all, to make it seem like you didn't know, but of course you really did. And and second of all, to make it seem like, you know, once we find out the facts, we're going to do something about it, which, of course, you're probably not going to do. So so that's a classic box sticker. Box ticking 
um, is all about filling out forms and paperwork, writing reports and uh, establishing metrics and otherwise spending your time assessing what you have done, want to do, will do in the future instead of actually doing it. Now, uh, that is a big element in the bullshitization of real jobs. Uh, so, for example, my job, you know, uh, I'm relatively safe. I, I have very little compared to a lot of academics. But nonetheless, I mean, they want me to fill out time allocation um, surveys every month that if I did it properly would probably take five hours to do. Those are five hours I could spend teaching. Instead, I have to spend, you know, writing out in detail exactly what I did, you know, how many hours I spent on what category of work every week, which is absurd because, first of all, I don't know. And, and, and second of all, who cares? Uh, all right. I would, I'll, I'll save my, my sort of like broader questions after we do the taskmasters. Okay. Taskmasters fall into two categories. Uh, they're the sort of people who actually supervise people who don't need supervision, right? Uh, a lot of middle management is like that. You know, you'll have offices where there's twice as many managers as there are workers. I mean, what are these guys doing? Uh, and and sometimes people will just write to me and say, yeah, I have a bullshit job in middle management. You know, I used to work in this office and they kicked me upstairs and now I'm supposed to supervise them and encourage them to work. And, you know, if I weren't there, they would they would work anyway. You know, they would do they'd probably do exactly the same thing as they're doing now. Uh, but I have to pretend I'm somehow making them do it or giving them the work which they could get themselves from the same guys I get it from. Um, I've even had people say who just recently been promoted to these kind of taskmaster jobs, you know, I wanted to do something because this is just bullshit. So I sort of allocated myself work and the higher ups found out and told me to cut it out. No, you're just supposed to give work to other people. Um, so, OK, so that's one category of taskmaster, people who are supervising people who don't need supervision. There's a lot of that. And the other one is actually making up uh, bullshit for people to do. And and so if you're a – that overlaps with box ticking to some degree. Uh, so, you know, if you're a manager and you realize that the people don't need supervision, what are you going to do? You're going to start making up tasks or making up – sometimes they make up entirely new jobs. Um, I remember someone talking about an office where she was a flunky, but she was a flunky who actually did work. Uh, basically, since most people there were managers and she was the only real employee, uh, she had to do everything. But there are these guys who just sort of sat around doing nothing, and they felt so embarrassed that, that nobody's doing anything. They wanted to people to think that, that they really had an excuse to exist. So they were hiring another unnecessary manager just to seem like they were all overworked. And so, all right, so what <laughs> – well, first off, and we should say the, you derive these by people writing to you uh, and, yeah. and then then just sort of like um, coming up with some type of uh, of characterization or some type of um, the yeah, taxonomy, I, I guess. It was. Um, I actually went out on Twitter. Uh, I have 68,000 followers or something like that at this point. Uh, probably it was only 62 at the time. And I said... You know, have you ever had a job that was just completely pointless that didn't need to exist? Tell me all about it. And I made up a Gmail account. Do I have a BS job or what at gmail.com? They wouldn't allow me to use bullshit in the title. Um, and who knew? Uh, and I got a lot. I got about 280 something odd testimonies. And some of them were just a paragraph, but some of them were like, 11 page narratives of my seven bullshit jobs with detailed sociological analysis of how they happened and how they perpetuate themselves. So, you know, and then of course I, I, for most of them, I at least wrote back once uh, and many of them, I had a long back and forth conversations with the people um, sort of investigating it all the details of how this happened or how they, uh, you know, did people know that you were doing this? Or how did this happen? Um, some of them were just incredibly beautifully written. Some of them were hilarious. Some of them were just shocking. Uh, so I took all of that and I put it in this gigantic file and then I color coded it. 
so I used that as my database, and I kind of went through and, and figured out um, the types of jobs from that. But I also, you know, developed a lot of these ideas in tandem with the people in the jobs. So box ticking was a term they used a lot themselves. Duct taping was one that I noticed people who talked about software using. So I kind of it, it was it was a dialogue, and 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 the terms emerged from the conversation. And so, do you have a sense of like when we're talking about these five categories? I mean, are we, do you have any sense of we're talking about? 20% of the jobs we're talking about 50% of the jobs like well this is interesting because i thought it was 15 to 20 i mean all the time that i first was doing this um well actually at first i didn't know at all at first i just kept meeting these people and is this something about you know or i should give his way a background here i am i'm a professor right um I don't come from this world, you know, it's not like I have academics in my family. I actually come from a working class background. So I've always felt a little bit out of place in this sort of world. It's basically the children of the professional managerial classes or other academics who become academics. So already I feel a little like an anthropologist in a foreign land here. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, and, and maybe it's something about the sort of people that you know, marry academics or, or are likely to be there in a party with these kind of people or your colleagues. And I just kept running into these people who, you know, when you ask what they do, they kind of act a little embarrassed and apologetic and say, well, not much, you know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, finally admit they work maybe two or three hours a week and other don't tell my boss, but basically I do nothing. Um, or they say, you know, well, I have this job, but it's basically a scam or it's basically pointless or it's, um, you know, because of a bureaucratic mistake. Nobody didn't know this. Um, this is, so at first I thought, I don't know how many people there are, but I keep running into them. So I wrote this piece almost as an experiment, you know, um, you know, it was a jo- almost a joke. You know, I said, well, maybe this is why we don't have 15-hour weeks like we're supposed to. Maybe they just made up all these jobs to keep us, you know, to keep us off the streets. Um, and I wrote it as, as a sort of a political provocation. And I wrote it in a pretty obscure publication. It's um, it the third issue of Strike Magazine, which spun off the International Times, the International Times being this old 60s underground paper that still exists uh, on, on the web. Um, barely still exists. And, um, you know, I knew somebody on it who was saying, well, we're going to start a project on a real newspaper. Uh, do you have anything for us? And, you know, just anything you want. And I said, anything? Okay. Um, here's something no one would possibly publish. So I wrote this little (laughs) rant and, um, I, I gave it to them and, and, and I was just shocked because the thing just went viral overnight. I, I, I keep saying uh, within two or three weeks, I think, uh, it was translated into something like 12 or 15 languages. I mean, it just went crazy all over the world. I mean, the server kept crashing. It was getting literally millions of hits. Um, and then came the confessionals. Um, I think the in Australia, uh, some newspapers ran it, and then Switzerland, and then a whole bunch of places. So, so with that, there were comment sections. So I started looking at the comment sections, and they were just amazing. All these people writing things like, Oh my God! It's it's true. I'm a corporate lawyer. I can, I contribute nothing to society. I I'm miserable all the time. You know this kind of thing. Um. So I thought, well, wow, there must be a lot of these people. But still, I was thinking fifteen percent, twenty percent, maybe, um, maximum. And then someone did a survey, and that was partly because the strike guys did a stunt. Uh, it was two years later. It was the day people were coming back from Christmas vacation, and they put up phrases from the article instead of advertisements on the subway on the tube in London. And that created a bit of a sensation. And, you know, all these things saying, you know, it's as if someone are out there making up jobs just to keep us working, that kind of thing. Uh, so, so that caused a bit of a stir, and uh, there was a little bit of a media bl- uh, bubble. And as a result, um, Someone did a survey, YouGov, and YouGov asked people, does your job make any meaningful contribution to the world? 37% of Britons who had jobs said no, absolutely not. Um, 50% said yes, and 13% weren't sure, uh, which is pretty shocking. I mean, it was way higher than I thought, like twice as high. Yeah, there was a couple of years later in Holland, it was even higher, it was 40%. That's- 
That's interesting. I mean, I because I, at first I was going to say, well, uh, I mean, of course it went viral because all those people who are not really doing something, they're just online looking exactly. to read something and, and they see themselves there. All right. So, I mean, we're talking about a large number of, of people. And in, in I mean, what how new of a phenomenon? Let's I mean. We, we obviously, we can't say for sure how many people, but let's just say whatever it is, a quarter of the workforce, maybe a little bit more, maybe half, I don't know. But how relatively new would you guess this is? I mean, because some of these things, like when you talk about like box tickers and when you talk about duct tapers um, and, and maybe goons to a certain extent, uh, but there seems to be a quality of of a new uh, genre of, of, of assessment involved in here right where you know so much of the work is a function of assessing what we're doing right now ostensibly yes. to be more efficient but of course the lack of efficiency is there like i i can just tell you that in my small enterprise there mm-hmm. are there's an enormous amount of data and mm-hmm. i could hire someone to crunch all these numbers but I'm still not convinced that I would actually be able to do anything with those numbers. But there's so much data for me to have. Um, if you're spending 50% of your time crunching the data, well, there's no way that the information you get will, will be, make you more efficient. Is this absurd? Yeah, I mean, there's I, 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 I would have all this data, uh, and I suppose it would be good or interesting to know, but if the agenda is like, grow my show or make more yeah. money from the show. I'm not convinced that that would, would help. Maybe some of it would, I don't know, but, um, but, but there, that seems to be a relatively new phenomena, like how data yeah. rich we have become. Maybe, maybe it goes back to like McNamara. I don't know. Uh, you know, like it, maybe it's, it's, it, it, it grew at that time out of like those Ford guys, but what, how, how recent a phenomena is this notion of jobs that are just there? And then we'll talk about why they're there. Okay. Um, that's a very interesting question. And it has to do with the growth of bureaucracy in general and bureaucracy as, as, as infiltrating every aspect of our lives. This is something I wrote about in my last book, a utopia of rules a little bit, but in terms of the jobs, it's very hard to get good metrics because they usually break it down into, you know, there's farming jobs, there's industrial jobs, and there's service jobs. And obviously, you know, farming has just collapsed. Industrial has gone down, although not as much as they say. And and service is just skyrocketed. But, but service is a very vague term, and it's very deceptive because, you know, if you say service economy, you think you're, you know, People are are washing each other's clothes or serving each other's coffee, and that's basically what we're doing with ourselves. It's actually not true. If you look at actual services in the sense of cutting hair, serving food, it's people working in service have remained pretty much constant at 20 percent of the workforce for about 100 years. There's no change, really. What what has changed is clerical, administrative, and supervisory work, And, and that's just collapsed into service. But if you have a different category, like information workers, uh, that kind of thing, well, that's just, just gone through the roof. And that's the section that's grown. And that's where most of the bullshit jobs are. And In fact, it seems like most people in those jobs feel that those jobs aren't really necessary, or only a very small fragment of what they do is necessary. And so is that a function of the explosion of, of information? And we are sort of like, as a society... Uh, broadly speaking, still trying to figure out, like... Yeah, I think that's one factor there. Um, I think also digital in- information technology, robotization, computerization, whatever you want to call it, has different effects on different sectors, and we haven't really taken that into account. Um, this is one of the proposals I make in the book. I say, well, look, it's perfectly obvious that if you're if you're sorting fruit, a machine will do that more efficiently, and they can develop you know, uh, technologies that will figure out which what's raw, what's ripe, and what's rotten and sort it appropriately. And that's very good because it's very boring. Um, if you're trying to figure out how to figure out, you know, what is the most interesting syllabus for a course, you're not going to have a computer do that. And to even pretend that you can have a computer do that, um, you have to do enormous amounts of work to put all the syllabuses in the same format so a computer can even look at right and and that work has to be done by people not by computers so like does it, you know to sort the fruit you just roll it into the bin the computer does the rest 
if you, on the other hand, for the syllabuses, you know, it's hours and hours and hours of work you wouldn't have had to do otherwise, turning it into identical formats so that you can feed it into the computer, which probably can't really do it anyway. And anyway, sorting through it is boring, but comparing syllabuses is interesting. I mean, students like to do that. Why should you computerize it? Um, this is just an example to show what I think is a more general principle, which is that digitization has opposite effects on anything having to do with creating, you know, manufacturers or creating products, um, commodities, and creating, and, and what I call caring labor. And I'm defining caring labor really broadly as not just taking care of people, but anything where you're working on other people in such a way as to nurture and sustain and help them grow and expand. So with anything from health to education to social services, anything like that, anything of a qualitative dimension, um, if you try to turn it, that qualitative activity into a form that a computer can recognize, into quantitative form, enormous amounts of human labor are involved that you wouldn't have to do otherwise. Now, as a result, if you digitize and computerize manufacturers, it, it makes it much more productive. And in fact, you get what they call technological deflation. Ultimately, things cost less because you're doing it more efficiently. Okay. On the other hand, if you try to digitize anything having to do with caring labor, it has the opposite effect. That is to say, um, you have it becomes less productive because the person who would otherwise be nursing is instead filling out forms about their nursing. The person who would otherwise be teaching is, you know, trying to create lesson plans in the format that the computer can compare to something else. Um, don't even talk about what happens to me. All right. Um, so, so as a result, that causes inflation. And that's exactly what we've seen during the period where they've insisted on trying to digitize everything. Uh, the cost of health, the cost of education has skyrocketed. And, and, and we should say, I mean, uh, the, as, as you talk about that um, uh, quantifying education, I mean, it's a real problem we have, I think, uh, with a lot of the education reform in terms of, of sort of the the quality of the outputs and um, yeah. and what it's done to to, to the teaching profession, but 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 broadly speaking, what I mean, what's wrong with th having twenty five percent of our workforce? Again, just sort of uh, you know, I'm picking an arbitrary number twenty five, thirty five, uh, even 35. if it's fifty. Uh, yeah. What what's wrong with having that much bullshit jobs? Okay, well, I think here we get to a very basic question about human nature. Uh, it is interesting that people who are in these kind of jobs regularly report themselves to be so miserable. And I think this points to a flaw in our basic conception of human nature. You know, economists in particular teach us that human beings are rational calculating machines that are trying to get the most reward for the least output. Essentially, we're all lazy or greedy bastards who want to go out and do as little as possible and get the most from it. So, you know, by that logic, we all want something for nothing if we can get it. And people who are get paid to do very little should be delighted. But they're not. And this is very interesting to me. In fact, it's it creates this cognitive dissonance. It creates this moral confusion because people feel that they don't have a right to complain. You know, they're getting something for nothing. But it's as if they're being forced to be parasites against their will. And the, it has this very, very deep and profound demoralizing effects. And, and, and so many of the testimonies I got testified to this. I mean, they talk about the le depression. They talk about incredible levels of stress. They talk about toxic workplace environments. Um, several people who either had different types of jobs, some of them obviously useful, some of them obviously useless, or alternately do both. Because there are some people who sort of make their money by doing useless stuff so that they can do useless, uh, useful things either for no money or very little for the rest of the week. Now, people who compare the two always say that like, you know, when everybody's working together on something they know is actually helpful to other people, they treat each other pretty well. But the moment everybody secretly knows that what they're doing is entirely pointless, they start screaming at each other, they start abusing, they're bullying, there's you know, terrible behavior. Um, so, so something about the uselessness of the work 
really has terrible psychological effects. Psychosomatic illness, it's another thing that happens all the time. Could part of it be also a certain amount of insecurity, right? Like somebody's going to find out that I'm yeah. not really, and then I'm going to lose this job. And I mean, it. You talk about imposter syndrome, right? But these people right. are forced to be imposters against their will. So, it, it, I mean, is there a a a macro impact? I mean, we have we're we're creating um, you know sort of like uh, some uh, mid level human misery, I guess. Um, yeah. And it, is there? Uh, it, what has large social effects that we don't even know? Um, Pierre Bourdieu liked to talk about the left and right hand of the state. He would say that. Um, mm, they talk about efficiency. So the right hand of the state are the economists who are going saying, well, if we create greater flexibility in jobs, it will create like larger productivity and, you know, the, uh, the overall social effects on wealth will be greater. Uh, but Borju pointed out that people, this is French, French sociologist, um, pointed out that people can only say that because we have this division it within the government of different types of statistics. So you have the economic guys keeping one form of statistics and another bunch of guys keeping the statistics on, you know, psychological breakdown, uh, alcoholism, suicide, uh, people who get into, you know, increasing drunkenness, leading to increasing accidents, leading to increasing health costs. So if you like, you know, look at the actual health, price of these policies, it's extremely expensive. It's exactly the opposite of what they say. But, you know, we don't measure the costs in the same column. So, I, I, so what, um, I mean, what, why do these exist? If, I mean, I, I think I, I know the answer on some level. Um, but I mean, is there if 40 percent of people are okay. in jobs that are useless, right? And, and, and presumably um, they're in, you know, maybe, I don't know, either big firms uh, and or in smaller firms, in which case somebody knows that it's useless. Like, what's what's um, how is that sustainable? Like why, uh, you know, what is What's going on with the market that supposedly is is efficient, that people would want to derive as much profit as possible? Why would you waste money on, you know... Well, interesting, uh, isn't it? Um, yeah. I think what this shows is that capitalism doesn't... Either capitalism doesn't work the way we think it does, or what we've got is rapidly becoming something other than capitalism. You can, you can call it either way you want. It's largely a matter of definition. But if you have a lot of small competing firms... Well, this isn't going to happen, right? Uh, I don't think there's many firms with five employees where one is doing nonsense. On the other hand, there's lots of firms with a thousand employees where, you know, I've heard, I read one guy said to me who is a, a bank efficiency expert that said probably 80% of the people working in a bank could easily be gotten rid of. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but but so, there's a quality there where everybody sort of looks around, right? I mean, I hate to, you know, show business is one of the few areas that I have any sort of, I guess, experience where I'm not just uh, 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 alone. But there was, it, it, it seemed to me that the entire business was uh, designed around uh, making sure that the the the, the written word was uh, king, as opposed to any other third elements of a production, because that's the one that executives could pretend like they knew yeah. they had input. Uh, they, I can read. Yeah. Uh, it's that's not, why it's, it's so bad now, right? Yeah, I mean, and, different people messing with the script. Yeah, the development uh, process, or yeah. like. I'm going to take, uh, you know, five meetings a day and nothing's going to happen at those meetings, but it's going to be clear that I'm meeting with people. Um, and, but, but that there is a quality where everybody's just looking around, like we're all creating a fiction and it's interesting that way, isn't it? Yeah. Whoever has the money, we're all going to like wink and nod and say, give us the money. This is what it takes, uh, right. to, put stuff churning out the other side and but it should be that way so much. I mean, this is the interesting thing. If you look at all the creative industries, right? Every single one has had, I call it sub infudation, you know, a managerial feudalism, but you have these ranks, you know, it used to be, there were just editors and there were writers. And now suddenly there's producers uh, this term they took from, you know, from movies or something, uh, who are in between the reporters and their editors. And then if you go to, like, 
you know, the movies where there always were producers. Now you have like 18 different levels of people, you know, these completely things that used to be completely unnecessary instead of just like I spin a plot, uh, you know, an idea for a script and this producer likes it and gives, says, OK, do it or a TV show. You have development where you have all these people making up, you know, sort of proposals and even like clips of uh, out for for movies that are probably never going to get made. And it's the same in academia. I mean, someone estimated that. So 1.4 billion euros are spent – it's like $1.7 million um, – are spent every year by European universities on failed grant applications. So we've created all this um, you know, internal competition, which is supposed to make things more efficient, but actually means that you just – enormous amounts of completely wasted effort. Uh, but it also allows for all these different ranks of intermediary bureaucrats or well, the executives, managers, you know, sort of interfering in things and, 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 and keep, keeping the balls bouncing and the plates spinning as long as possible. I mean, but so, I mean what – what is driving this and is it i mean is it just simply a necessary thing uh, you know like a dynamic uh, Sorry, i mean it never used to happen um i think what a large part of it is financialization that is to say the you know, profits for, on wall street and the city here in the uk um in frankfurt and all the the big economic centers Profits are no longer so much coming from making things or selling things as they are coming from rent extraction, from finance. And as I always say, finance is just another word for other people's debts, you know, um, creating debts and exploiting them. And large firms, even firms that make cars or light bulbs, are making their money largely from their financial divisions rather than their industrial divisions. So they're not making money from selling the cars they're, they're making their money from lending you the money to buy the cars. So insofar as you have a fi financially driven economy, then it's not that different from feudalism. You're extracting rents and then you're redistributing it. So the difference between politics and economics blurs. And this is classically true of feudalism where you really can't tell the difference between the two at all. But it's very much true nowadays because you're no – the role of the government has shifted. It used to be the government was there to sort of guarantee your property rights if you're a capitalist and then you go off and you make your money based on that. But now the government is actually directly involved in extracting profits because I'm trying to trick people into debt or get people into a situation where I can extract money from them. That's all done through the legal system. So, so the government's directly entailed. But even, so, 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 you know, lobbyists write the regulations that regulate banks and like which is government, which are banks is is entirely unclear. Um, so. Okay, so you have that situation. But in that situation, if you have a huge pot of money and you're distributing it, you're extracting things and then redistributing the money again, and the difference between politics and economics is blurring, well, you know, the logic shifts. So under classic capitalism, you don't want to employ too many people because you want to make profits. But now um, you have these little empires, with corporate empires, and – Actually, I, I, I got some examples of this. Um, this is the sort of the big giveaway was this guy who was talking about PPI. It was a big thing here in the UK. Uh, it's um, essentially they found out that banks had made a mistake and they have to give millions of people money back. And I heard similar things about asbestos in, in America, law firms that were hired uh, to um, to to compensate people for asbestos. So, you know, here's a billion dollars or whatever it might be is set aside and you're supposed to give it out. But what these people would report is that people were intentionally doing it badly. They were mistraining people. They were intentionally putting offices in the wrong cities or destroying documents so that had to be created and destroyed again. They're just trying to make the thing last as long as possible. You say, well, why are they doing that? And you realize, of course, if they've got a you know, billion dollars and they're supposed to distribute it to people, the longer it takes to distribute the money – the more they get to keep. Uh, uh, because people die, or is it just simply I sit on the float? No. no, I mean, it's not like they're giving them a fixed amount of money. They're giving them a percentage of the pot. So the less of the pot, the more longer it takes, the less of a pot there is, the less money they get, the more the company keeps, or the more they can charge its fees in the process. And so um, it, th this financialization, basically other people are making money off of the fat is basically what it is. 
Yeah, they're just moving money around, and like the the, the longer they take, and the, the less efficient they are, it doesn't hurt them at all. And in a lot of ways, it helps them. And so, um, what, I mean, what is the? I mean, I guess what is the solution to this? And who would? I mean, who would it behoove in this instance? I mean, obviously, the people who have these jobs, they would like. <laughs> Uh, I mean, they presumably they would want jobs that are more fulfilling or not have jobs. Or... I mean, think about it this way. Um, I, mean, I got a lot of a lot of testimonies from people in in government and who basically, in fact, from both sides, uh, both people whose job was to make it as difficult as possible for people to get their benefits or money that in theory they had a right to from the government. And they felt terrible about it. Actually, it's quite interesting because some of these guys who are like there to, you know, they're people in homeless shelters and their job was to like kick them out if they don't have the right three forms of ID, which usually you don't if you're homeless. You ask, you know, how do people like that live with themselves? Often the answer is they don't. I mean, they feel terrible. I think often the, the turnover rate is enormous. Um, and so, so a lot of those people – Losing my track of thought here. Sorry. Um, well, I, I was asking what, what the other side. Now I remember. Yes. Okay. Um, and then there's the other side, who are the guys who are there to litigate against them. So, you get, so because they set up the system in such a way, it's like the contest system again, to to make it as difficult as possible for you to get your benefits. They have to have another class of people whose job is to stand up for the person whose benefits have been denied, or to guide people through the maze that they've created to make it as hard as possible for them to get their benefits. So you have like two ranks of jobs, and they're both those people are sitting there saying. This is stupid. I wish these jobs didn't exist. So one of the pe- people I know who's actually a benefit advisor, you know, told me, like, what they should do is just give everybody money. You know, I'm universal basic income. Just everybody gets $10,000 a year. Um, after that, 15, something, you know, minimal, but like enough that you can eat. Um, and after that, it's up to you. And if we do that, uh, unconditional, everybody get the same amount of money, then – well, 20,000, you know. Um, well, what is going to happen? All those guys can quit. You won't need them anymore. In fact, it's a perfect left-wing anti-bureaucratic uh, proposal because not only will you get rid of a lot of bureaucrats who are deciding whether or not you deserve this or whether surveilling you, monitoring you, seeing if you're really married to that person, seeing if you're really using that room, seeing if you're really ho- looking hard enough to get a job. Those guys who like really feel guilty and for the most part uh, and hate their jobs, um, they, they can quit. Uh, so not only are you getting rid of reducing the size of bureaucracy, you're getting rid of the, the, the worst of them. The bureaucrats are doing the most harm. And those guys can go all go all found, create a samba band or restore antique furniture, do whatever they like. They'll be happier and the world will be a better place for it. And, and we should say, though, I mean, in the event that that happened, the GDP would go down. Well, maybe, but right. You know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't care. But I mean, that is like another one of those metrics where it's like, uh, yeah, it all depends on how you measure. I mean, like as people have pointed out, if we had a giant oil spill and covered the entire country of America with oil and then cleaned it all up again, GDP would go through the roof. Right. 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 Yes. I mean, there was a, a movement afoot, it seems to me, in the early 90s to recalculate this, like to actually yeah. like have a negative uh, side on the on the ledger. Like, hey, yeah. I can't go out and breathe today because I've got oil covering my, uh, you know, or whatever it is. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, the the I mean, ultimately, um, it is it's uh, UBI would just free up um, uh, these energies. I mean, this is uh, an argument we used to make about just uh, like means testing uh, social security or something like all the extra bureaucracy is not going to save you any money. Anyways, you might as well just it's negative. It's always negative. I mean, some people have done studies of that here. First of all, any, if you add any conditionality at all onto benefits, then 20% of people who deserve it won't get it. Partly because they just won't even bother. They'll just give up and not even try. So, you know, unless you're eliminating 20 percent of uh, on, uh, other people who are uh, would otherwise be trying to trick you and get fraudulent money, um, it seems really unlikely is 20 percent is usually more like two. Uh, you know, you're, you're actually losing from the deal. And. 
yeah, it's it's absurd. And you're, you're employing all these people, so and, and and those people never find enough fraud to justify their own existence. I don't think there's ever been a case where they have. Let's. I mean, just lastly, I mean, just tell me about the sort of the the resentment that 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 you um, uh, talk about between the those people who have bullshit jobs and those who don't. Uh, yeah. This is very interesting. And it starts from an article I wrote many years ago called Army of Altruists. Um, I didn't make up the title, but what I was I was really interested in right wing populism. Why it is that so many members of the working class, and this is one thing that actually does divide the white working class and um and others, is that why do they seem to resent the cultural elite more than they resent the economic elite? So you know, I mean, most Trump voters, for example, don't like uh, – and of course a lot of these guys are petty bourgeois and not really working class. But even the sort of working class, white populist, right-wing populist, I mean, you know, why do they ha- hate members of what they think of as the liberal elite Hollywood, people like that? And, and you know, they don't like capitalists very much, but it's not visceral. It's not what they really care about. And – I thought about this and I realized, well, to some degree, it's just common sense, because if I'm a truck driver, if I'm a air conditioner repair guy, you know, and I have a really smart kid, I can imagine that kid could become rich. I mean, it's not likely, right? But it could happen. I, but there's just no possible way that my kid is ever going to be drama critic for the New York Times or is ever going to be an international human rights lawyer, is ever going to be a Hollywood script writer. It's just not going to happen. So and, and Hollywood is, te- you know, the sort of arch enemy of these guys and it makes sense because you know 50 years ago well when you thought about hollywood the fantasy was as a place where anybody could go and be discovered you know iowa farm girl goes to the big city a star is born you know maybe it happened now and then but the point is people thought it would happen nowadays nobody has any fantasies like that nowadays if you look at like almost any movie star they have a genealogy going back three or four generations of people who worked in the industry it's like an in marrying cast um, but that's just typical of, of what's going on in almost all those jobs, and it's perceived as such. So it's not only that they think these guys think we're a bunch of knuckle-dragging cavemen, which, of course, you know, members of that group do think about the working class that way. But it's also that you know, here are these bunch of guys who skip to the front of every line they've ever been on, and now they claim to be these big, like, you know, lefty uh, work for the common people, like hell they are. Um, you know, they're, they never let anybody in my family near those good jobs. But what are good about the jobs? You know, all, all, if you want to be in journalism, if you want to be in art, if you want to be in charity or, you know, anything which isn't just for the money, then you have to live on an unpaid internship in a big city for three years, you know, even after you've gone for the right college. So basically, you know, they won't pay you at first. So if you don't come from the right background, there's just no way you're going to break in. But those are the jobs which are essentially where you get well paid to do something creative and useful. Right. So those are the good jobs, right? Really good jobs, you know, we are frozen out of. And that's why it goes along with the support the troops concept. It doesn't, it's, which seems weird. Why we hate the liberal elite and support the troops almost always goes together. Well, it kind of makes sense in this case because, you know, if you are come from a working class background and you do want to actually get paid to do something which isn't just for the money, which is noble, um, maybe not creative, but at least noble, um, well, what can you do? You can join the army. Okay, so, so, so you have that. You have this resentment of people who get paid well to do actually creative, interesting, good jobs. So what I realize is there's another side to that. So you have the working class who resent these mem- you know, this sort of liberal elite group, and then you have the bullshit job guys. And the bullshit job guys resent the working class because at least they get to do something. They get to do something that's actually useful. So there's a double resentment going on. Um, and, and I've noticed this, like, teachers or auto workers. I was going to say, like, where do teachers fall in that scenario? I think teachers are, are actually deeply resented for doing something useful. Uh, and, and people, people but, will say that. You know, teachers shouldn't get paid a lot because we don't want people who are just motivated by money teaching our students, you know? Right. Um, yeah. But, um, but but isn't that I mean, but but where does it, I mean, because isn't it the 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 liberal elite that supposedly appreciates teachers? Yeah. 
They do. Um, I mean, how does that fit into the... I mean, like, I get what you're saying about, like, you know, uh, the resent of, uh, you know, the Hollywood people. They get to have, like, this avocation, you know, basically, like, what some people would consider as a hobby, and they get paid a lot of money to do it. Lots of money to do something creative and interesting, like... Yeah, like, that sounds like you're getting paid to have fun. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And w- which I can attest to is true, incidentally. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but but how does that? F- I don't see where teachers fit in there. I know that there's resent towards teachers um, mm-hmm. and begrudged <laughs> the tiny amounts of money that they make. But but they also have a job that is as you know important to society as a truck driver, let's say, or is exactly. Is, you know, and people resent truck drivers too. To some, well, it depends on how much they're actually paid. Um, auto workers is a great example. No, I mean, what I'm saying is teachers are essentially, okay, there's two types of resentment. There's working class resentment of the people who get the really good jobs. And then there's this kind of bullshit job people, and they resent people who actually do something useful. So they're the guys who are resenting teachers Uh. and also actually people like auto workers. I, I noticed this after the 2008 crash, right? Who got, had to make sacrifices? Who had to take pay cuts? Not the bankers. They did fine, right? Even though they caused the mess. Um, not even, you know, when they saw, when they saved the auto industry, they didn't even make the auto executives or um, those guys who created the problems in the auto industry take pay cuts. The guys who had to take pay cuts were the actual line assembly line guys. Right. And why did that make any sense? But they were making all this like noise in the sort of right wing radio saying, oh, well, a lot of these guys are making like fifty four dollars an hour. You know, they're actually making twenty five dollars an hour. But that with the benefits, you know, which, of course, if you do that to anybody, they're making twice what they're making. Um, they were, you know, so there seemed to be this idea of like, yeah, but you guys get to make cars. You know, you shouldn't expect to like go to the Grand Canyon with your kids and 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 have like dental care too. That's not fair, you know. Um, you know, I'm doing nothing all day. I deserve benefits, but and and same with teachers. You know, there seemed to be this idea of like you chose a self-sacrificing and, right. and benevolent um, sort of profession. How dare you make demands to like actually get a lot of money too? Yeah, it's it's uh, fascinating uh, stuff. Uh, bullshit jobs, a theory by David Graeber. And that's a zero sum game. Right, David? I get to be Cynthia Nixon's boyfriend on Sex in the City and no one else because it's a zero sum game. Ah, uh, that's fascinating. I would just. <laughs> well, whatever. I'm sure that this will get hashed out in the fun half, but. Uh, I wouldn't personalize what he's talking about, be all I would say. But I'm sure that there's not, well, whatever. Well, I'm sure we'll get to it. But uh, David Graeber, I don't know much about, but he did not sit down across from us and throw a fistful of pistachios in his mouth and go, I'm looking to write a book where I insult people's professions. (laughs) It wasn't the point of, uh, of this particular effort. It was something a little bit more substantive going on there. Um. All right. I gonna, respect it. I respect it too. In fact, <laughs> if if the uh, if there was Mike uh, in this office during that interview, we would get into a lot of trouble. But it would be very fun content. Um, as is actually usually the case. Uh, if if you released the office conversations, this show would be a monster. Um, That's not true. It's we're it's, very boring. Inconsequential. Nothing said here. That's yeah. So if oh, okay. Sure. If yeah. there's ever accidentally like a hot mic on mean. the line, I don't even talk when the show's not on. Oh, These are the oh. only times I talk. In well, the that's office. true. No, Brendan's I am. mute. Brendan goes. Brendan just like here are your chats, sir. No, and if anything comes out, as I always say, uh, I've been hacked. It's, no, it's that's voice reproduction. Voice technology. reproduction technology Russian at all bots. times. Russia, 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 Russia. Um, okay, folks, we're going to the fun half. Become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how this show happens. Check out The Antifada. When, is it, is, when did the new show drop this week? We usually release it on Wednesdays. So Word. We and it was Natasha Leonard. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and, there's, and there's bonus content now, right? Yeah, we've done one uh, bonus for our patrons called Real Tanky Hours. Where we uh, dig into the horrifying depths of the 
dumb dumb left internet and find wow, some wow dumb dumb things. left tm michael brooks i love it it's catching that, that on. phrase has really had more lasting power than that I episode thought. was on maoist incels right um he he's he's like a marxist incel Let me tell you something. it's like the fusion chairman mao Marxism, not an incel. Leninism, and not an Elliot incel. Rogers' manifesto. It's horrifying. That is truly horrifying. I think actually, and I don't know, you guys know way more about this stuff than I do, but I believe that Sean actually sent me this a couple of months ago, and I actually got through about a third of it before I was like, I don't want to see this. <laughs> well, I don't want to know that this exists. We <sighs> got through the whole thing, and I was very tired because it was like midnight at this point in time and we had just recorded another episode but uh we we were in it to win it we just respect it out and now i feel a whole new level of dread you're crushing it uh brennan i was just gonna say jamie i meant to give you a signal or something but you're you're on camera now in the big seat how's it feel you gonna make me self-conscious that was not the intent (laughs) no it's it's cool hi hi everyone this is what I look like. I'm just saying that the Discord is losing its mind right now. Oh my god. They're they're, they're great. I love them. Wait, the Discord on TMBS or the YouTube chat? I don't know. Do I look you, all right? You don't know He's wait. just predicting. Oh, 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 I got you. Correct. I'm sure you're totally right. Shout out to the TMB on Discord, TMBS Discord. Uh, of course, you can become a patron of my show, the Michael Brooks Show, at TMBS, at patreon.com slash TMBS. This Sunday, uh, illicit history of global Marxism that I just recorded with Bill Fletcher Jr. Last Sunday, a deep dive into the Arusha Declaration and Tanzanian socialism. It's a little bit of a series. Next week... Felix Biederman is back in studio, and Marisha, uh, Bar- I'm, you know what, I'm not even going to try. I have to work on her name. But she's a brilliant law professor at University of Georgia, and she helped write the postal banking legislation. So, so she's the guest. We're talking about federal job guarantee, postal banking. and then Sam's going to feel jealous about that. Oh, that was, why can't I? Well, I told him. I said it's a zero-sum game. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and then... Uh, and then uh, Felix and I are going to talk about uh, Yakub and uh, real hip hop uh, and much more. Um, plus, two woke bros and uh, is also dropped uh, there as well. So, thanks everybody. 646 257 3920. 646 257 3920. I am Zero Open. See you in the fun half. Yeah. Everyone knows that, and it almost wouldn't even have to be said.